part is our gospel reading, a place where Jesus says, love your enemies. Someone wants to borrow from you, don't turn them away. There's places in the gospels where Jesus says not to worry about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink or what you're going to wear. He says we don't need to worry about those things because God will provide them. Jesus told a parable. It's called the parable of the rich fool. A farmer has bumper crops and he has so much to harvest that he has to build new bins to store it in. He thought he had it made for several years. He said, I'm just going to sit back and enjoy life now. And Jesus said that very night he would die. And whose would all that be? Jesus said, turn the other cheek. Now these teachings of Jesus are the exact opposite of how we live our lives. We live our lives striving for what we're going to eat and drink and wear. We live our lives storing up for the future. We don't turn the other cheek. We don't live lending money to whoever wants it and never expect to be paid back. But yet Jesus, in no uncertain terms, flatly, clearly told us to live like that. You talk about stuff that there's no argument about. You cannot argue with the fact that Jesus said those things. He said them. They're crystal clear. But they're unrealistic. How can you survive in the world if you don't try to provide yourself food, clothing, and shelter? How can you survive if you don't at least try to plan a little for the future? How can you survive if you don't try to protect yourself Protect your loved one. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus said, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Who among us, though, has not put our hand to the plow and at least glanced back just a little bit? And there are many, many more such sayings in the Gospels coming straight from the mouth of Jesus. <coughs> In fact, things like that comprise the majority of the teachings of Jesus. Yet they're unrealistic. The majority of the teachings of Jesus are simply unrealistic. You cannot survive in the world if you follow the teachings of Jesus. And yet that's what we're supposed to do. Now I want to look at something else. This comes from the book of 1 John. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. For God's seed remains in him and he cannot sin. Because he has been born of God. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Now we talked about that idea not long ago. It seems clear, if you're a Christian, you do not sin. If you sin, that means you're not a Christian. We talked about how many ancient Christians took that seriously. They believed that once you became a Christian and were baptized, all of your sins were forgiven. But they looked at forgiveness as a one-time thing. If you became a Christian and were baptized on February the 2nd, 2020, all the sins you had committed prior to that were forgiven. But the sins you commit after that won't be forgiven, so you should never sin again. Forgiveness was a one-time thing. It didn't take long, though, for people to realize that was impossible. You could not live without sinning. They tried and tried, but they found it was impossible. People got the idea, and they said, well, you know, the reason we can't live without sinning is that we're living within society. And you know, there's a lot of sin going on in society. If we would just withdraw from society, we could live without sin. And this led to something called the Desert Fathers Movement. It started taking place about 200 years after the time of Jesus. The Desert Fathers Movement was the name of the movement where people just started moving out into the desert, usually in Egypt, and living alone as hermits or in very small group. 
and they live cut off from society. They live the life of prayer and contemplation and study. And in this way, they thought they could live without sinning. And this was a major movement within Christianity that started about 10 years after, 200 years after the time of Jesus. Just walk away from society, go out and live in the desert as a hermit. But people soon found that even by doing that, they were unable to live without sinning. And so the idea developed that although the Bible does say these things, and although Jesus said these things, you can't take it at face value. You've got to put an interpretation on it. The first way that was done is they would put the interpretation on that the teachings of Jesus could be divided into two categories. One were the precepts. And those are the teachings of Jesus that everybody had to follow. The other classification was called counsels. And it would be good if you could follow the counsels. It would be good if you could follow a few of them. If you could, that would bring you closer to God, but you don't have to. All you have to do is follow the precepts. Now, the people that try to follow some of the councils will be on a higher plane than the average Christian. And so Christians were divided into two groups. The ones who just followed the precepts, that means the ones who just did what they had to do, and then the ones who followed some of the councils. They were on a higher spiritual plane. And the councils were generally, most all, of the teachings of Jesus. Sermon on the Mount, for example. Everything in the Sermon on the Mount was seen as a council. You could follow them if you wanted to, and if you did, you'd get a special blessing for it, but you didn't have to. And this was, in general, the way it was looked at until, uh, until the Protestant Reformation. The Protestants were hesitant to divide Christians into two classes, the average and the spiritually higher. So they said, we don't think that's right. So they developed another way of looking at it rather than the precepts and counsels. The Protestants said, you know, we think human society is very important. And after all, all of us live in human society. And we go to the New Testament and we see how the Apostle Paul wrote and said that we should be good citizens in society, we should work and earn our own way, we should be obedient to the laws of society. And they took this to mean that if you're a Christian, your first obligation is to be a good citizen in society. They believe that you should make your own way, earn your own living, obey all the laws of the government, and enforce the laws of the government. And obviously they went back and they said, if Jesus said not to worry about what you'll eat or drink or wear and don't store up for tomorrow, well, you're not going to be able to make your own way and be a good citizen in society. So if you, if you live that way, and if you want law and order in society, you can't turn the other cheek. And so they developed the idea that your primary obligation is to society. You should live your life according to the things that will make society function well. If faced with the choice between following the teachings of Jesus and doing something that will make society function, you should ignore the teachings of Jesus and do what will make society function better. In fact, you are under a moral obligation to ignore the teaching of Jesus and do what would make society function better. In order to survive in the world, you live by the rules of the world, even if you have to do things that are against the teachings of Jesus. Because according to the Protestants, remember, your first obligation is to human society. Just as an example, there has to be law and order in society. So if you turn the other cheek, that would lessen law and order in society. So they said that it would actually be a sin to follow the teaching of Jesus and turn the other cheek. 
You follow the teachings of Jesus only if that does not conflict with the workings of society. And so in mainstream Christianity, we had two possible ways of looking at these unrealistic teachings of Jesus. The first one said that they are for people who are wanting to be on a higher spiritual plane and from all those teachings you can pick and choose a few to try to follow and if you do that you'll be on a higher spiritual plane. But you don't have to. You'll be fine. The other says that your first obligation is to society. And since society cannot operate the way we want it to operate, if we follow those teachings of Jesus, it is actually a sin to follow. Now there is a third way of looking at this. And to find it, you go all the way back to the first book of the Bible. That's the book of Genesis. And remember in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve eat a piece of fruit God told them not to eat. And when they do that, it says they realize they're naked. So they make clothes for themselves out of fig leaves. Then God comes up and he confronts them with what they've done. He expels them from the Garden of Eden. And when God expels them, he tells Adam that from now on, you will earn your living by the sweat of your brain. You see, the idea is that in the Garden of Eden, the way God originally intended things to be, people didn't need clothes. People didn't have to work for a living. It was all just provided. The fact that we need clothes and have to work for a living is a result of what happened when Adam and Eve ate the fruit. The way things are now is not the way things originally were and not the way God wanted them to be. The reason we have to worry about all the things we worry about today is because we live in what's called a fallen world, to use the theological term for it. And that just means that we live in a world that everything has changed. And so this idea says that when Jesus was talking in the Gospels and saying, turn the other cheek, lend to whoever asks, he was not talking about the way things are now. He was talking about the way things would have been had Adam and Eve not eaten the fruit. The way things could have been if things were still as God originally made them. And Jesus is telling us that life one day will again be so that we can follow those things because one day God's going to come, destroy evil, and make everything go back to the way he originally wanted it to be. And at that time, we can live according to the teachings of Jesus. But that time has not yet come. We still live in a fallen world. The teachings of Jesus are for a utopian world. And we live in a fallen world. And so we look at these teachings of Jesus as being a description of the world that one day will be, but that is not. And I guess of all the three options we've looked at today, this last one seems to be probably the most attractive to us. But the problem about that is that Jesus didn't say, I'm telling you the way things will be one. Jesus said, go and live like this. See, there's a problem with that explanation. Nowhere did Jesus even hint that these things were not to be followed. Nowhere did Jesus even hint that this was just a description of the way things were one day. Nowhere. And so we're left with these unrealistic teachings of Jesus that we think that we just can't follow. We have to be careful about ignoring the teachings of Jesus. So what do we do with it? We cannot make life go back immediately to be the way God intended for it to be. So we cannot live 100% by the teachings of Jesus. 
but we can make an attempt. We can hold them up as the army. We can't make it to be where you don't have to earn your living. Otherwise, you'll start to be. But we don't have to get carried away and be like Mr. Scrooge. We don't have to, we can't make it to where you can't live. You can live by turning the other cheek. But we can have it as the idea. The teachings of Jesus are not just for people that are on a higher spiritual plane. And neither are they teachings that tell us how things one day may be. Neither are they teachings to be ignored because our first obligation is to society. They are teachings to be taken seriously by everyone, although it is in fact possible, impossible, to pattern our lives 100% living by them. We are always to hold them up as the ideal and try whenever possible to incorporate them in our lives, even if it costs us something. Even if it means we're not as successful and prosperous as we could have been by not following. If there's any problem among American Christians today, is that most Christians want Christianity that costs them nothing. It's a difference of attitude. We know that today we sometimes have to involve ourselves in things that are strictly speaking not right. We do that in order to survive. We can't always turn the other cheek. But the difference is that when we're in a situation where we cannot turn the other cheek, we don't gloat over it. When we cannot turn the other cheek, we don't do it very humbly. We do it very humbly and without blaming. We do it regretfully. When it's impossible to turn the other cheek, we do it regretfully. Realizing that we've stepped over the line, but that we have to. We do have to plan for the future, at least to some extent, but we don't have to make that the focus of our lives. We do have to have food, clothing, and shelter, but we don't make gods out of those things. And we don't make that the focus of our life. When we look at those passages that say you cannot sin if you're a Christian, we know we're going to sin if we're a Christian. But we try not to. We try not to. When we sin, when we see ourselves involved in sin, we recognize it, we turn from it, and we resolve to stay away from it. Will we always succeed? No. But we make an effort I've said in here before the difference in non-Christians and Christians is that Christians make an effort. Christians may not be perfect, but they make an effort. And so we make an effort. Are we willing to make the changes in our lives that are required? Are we willing to make major sacrifices in order to give our life, move our life closer to the teaching of Jesus? Are we going to ignore them? The teachings of Jesus may seem unrealistic. And it's true, you cannot survive in the world that we live in and follow them. But that doesn't mean you can't ever follow them. You can follow them. And when you do, you know what you're doing? You're providing the world with a glimpse of what heaven will one day be like. You see, it is said that our best Christian witness is not what we say, but it's what we do. If you say you're a Christian, you better believe that people are watching you. They're watching how you live their, your life. Because you see, the way you live your life is your Christian witness to others. They look at your life and they say, that's what Christianity is. That's embodied in that person.
May God grant that people would see a difference in our lives and in the lives of those who are not Christians.